Good evening. Welcome to Science on Tap. I'm Susan Glassman. I'm the director of the Wagner Free Institute of Science, and um, we are your hosts for tonight's Science on Tap. Our guest speaker is Christina Rosan, who is Associate Professor of Geography and Urban Studies at Temple University, and we're glad to welcome her. If this is your first time joining us, Science on Tap is a free gathering held on the second Monday of every month. Science on Tap's usually held um, at Na the Bar National Mechanics in Old City, but due to the pandemic, we've been having these events on Zoom for about two years now. We're hoping to return to in-person talks in the late summer or fall, but we haven't worked out the schedule. If you're not already on our um, email list, please sign up for the newsletter, and that'll keep you posted on the most up-to-date information about our future Science on Tap programming. As you probably know, Science on Tap is sponsored by a consortium of six Philadelphia institutions, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, the American Philosophical Society, the Mütter Museum of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, the Penn Museum, Science History Institute, and the Wagner Free Institute of Science. If you love us, meaning Science on Tap, please follow us on Facebook and join our email list, which you can do on the website scienceontapphilly.com and that'll be in our closing slide as well so you can link to it. Aside from Science on Tap with our partners, I have one announcement um, about the Wagner. We also offer free talks um, as part of our weeknights at the Wagner evening lecture series, which has also been on Zoom for the past two years. Now on to our talk for this evening. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Christina Roseanne. As I said, she's associate uh, professor of Geography and Urban Studies at Temple University. She's working on a collaborative project called Act on Air, which is accessible community technology on air, and is partnering with universities, citizens, schools, and nonprofits across the city to install low-cost air, purple air monitors in Philadelphia's neighborhoods. Act on Air is uh, working to raise awareness about local air quality and help empower people to advocate for systemic policy change. She is also the co-author of the book, Reimagining Sustainable Cities, Strategies for Designing Greener, Healthier, More Equitable Communities. So tonight she's gonna be talking about her project to help people and city officials monitor our air quality, environmental justice, and also using climate investments to address community needs. So now I'll let Christina take it away. And as you know, the presentation is about half an hour, then she'll open up the chat for feedback from you and for a Q&A. So enjoy, thank you, Christina. Hi, thank you, Susan. That's a really nice introduction. And I'm really excited to be a part of this. I'm sorry we're not at the bar, which sounds fun, um, but I appreciate all of you um, coming out and spending time with me and everyone tonight. I'm going to try to um, get through this as quick as possible so that we can have a conversation because I really want to hear from you about what you think and, and actually how you can help me and colleagues because the project that we're talking about is a slightly scrappy project um, and you'll see that I need your help. Um, so um, the reason this is called Act on Air is we have a larger NSF project, which is called um, Planning for Resilience th th and Equity Through Accessible Community Technology. And that is called PREACT. And, um, and as a part of that larger project, we have um, been working to um, figure out how to use these smaller, this is a purple air monitor. It's like a $279 monitor, um, how to use this monitor as a way to kind of supplement the conversation about air quality and environmental justice um, and to kind of get um, the city to act and to get citizens to act. So that really what we're trying to, um, argue, in, and um, I will say that I really need to give a huge shout out to Russell Zerbo at the Clean Air Council, who is um, really the kind of brains behind the Purple Air um, initiative. But, you know, through these sensors and the awareness of 
um, what is happening in your community and your local um, neighborhood. Um, we are hoping to activate a much larger conversation about environmental justice um, that, you know, kind of runs through different parts of the city. So um, getting the city's monitoring network to acknowledge local monitoring, using the purple air monitors as a way to talk to students, um, getting university students involved in thinking about what they can do, um, and getting citizens to be more aware of um, what is happening and what we can do to act on air. So that's really the kind of title of the project. Um, and a lot of people ask me, um, you know, does Philadelphia have good air quality? Um, and the answer is really no. Um, and that comes in part from being located where we are um, on, you know, the 95 corridor. Um, we also have a lot of people commuting in their cars from the suburbs. That's a little bit down from um, the kind of because of the pandemic. Uh, we have um, very uh, small, fine particulates that we are breathing in. Um, and, you know, so we are not ranking well, uh, 12th most polluted city in the nation. And increasingly, I think also because of COVID, we have really become aware of how important your lungs are. You know, what are, what are, what are the impacts of breathing things um, you know, throughout your childhood and, and different and, you know, what, how does that make you vulnerable to other environmental justice um, uh, uh, causes, uh, challenges. So um, I think air is actually a really great place to start and it's not always visible and we're really trying to make it more visible. Um, so if I go to the next slide. Um, the other thing about Philadelphia is it really depends, like air quality means different things to different people. So, um, you know, it, it could be that, um, you know, the air quality is not great, but it, you're okay because your health is okay. But if you have a lot of underlying conditions or you're um, elderly or you're very young or you live in a neighborhood with a lot of cumulative environmental justice health impacts, um, you know, the health, the air quality is, is interacting with other um, vulnerabilities. So uh, your neighborhood also very much, this is the built environment, very much affects what you're um, experiencing. So it, particularly in the summer, we have a lot of um, growing evidence that the urban heat island is an enormous challenge for the city of Philadelphia. And we have some data that shows that some neighborhoods that have much more asphalt and don't lack tree canopy, they can be up to 22 degrees hotter during the summer. And that also means that um, there's the, the ozone um, effect at the, having like the actual kind of how much ozone you're breathing in at the, um, is, is worse in the urban heat island uh, um, neighborhoods. So what I think is really important is also understanding that there's a lot of inequity about air quality. Um, there's also, um, you know, air quality kind of also depends, and we don't always think about this, but this kind of shows how we exist in a larger system. But, you know, if there's a huge forest fire in uh, the Pacific Northwest or California, that air travels across the country. And, you know, I, I was, uh, Russ and I were on the radio, uh, I think it was last summer, it might have been the summer before, I can't remember. But, um, you know, every summer there's a huge forest fire. So, uh, but, you know, that we found these purple air monitors were flying off the charts and it turned out it was because all the air was coming from the West Coast. So being able to kind of um, have citizens become more aware of, you know, oh, today a good air quality day, what other things are happening in the country um, is, is something that we think these purple air monitors have the ability to do when they're combined with other monitors. The other thing that we've been really interested in, I'll talk more about later, is um, you know there are also times when there can be real air emergencies. And this happened with the tire fire that happened last November. Um, we what I found is I had this purple air monitor on my house, and the, my purple air monitor was off the charts. But the city wasn't sending out. Um, you know the city wasn't telling you to do anything or cover your mouth or close your window or like, you know, hide in your basement or whatever, whatever you should be doing. Um, and so like, it became very clear to me that there's a real gap 
in the kind of information that the city is giving you, the scale that they're giving it to you and the immediacy of it. And so some of these new technologies might be, have the ability to kind of fill that gap. Um, obviously this needs to be done scientifically in collaboration between communities and the city. And there's like a lot of trust work that needs to happen and a lot of political work that needs to happen. But um, I think by, by kind of bringing in these purple air monitors, they're not perfect, but they get us started on a conversation. Um, and the more that we can all talk about air, we can talk about all the other things associated with air and environmental justice and cumulative impacts and um, climate change and what we can do about it. Um, so air quality is, um, I mean, one of the reasons is good to talk about air quality is because it's, it is a non-point um, pollution. So it's not coming from just one place. It's coming from cars. It's coming from, um, you know, heating systems coming from um, it, like, you know, other places and uh, fossil fuel burning. And, uh, you know, there's so many air quality is, uh, it's really just this mix of all of our actions, uh, both local, state, and national and international. And um, so, you know, we we see this, you know, we're breathing in this mix. Um, we tend to think that we don't have a lot to do, you know, we don't have a lot of control over it, because it's true. A lot, a lot of the environmental, you know, being able to really improve the air is gonna take a lot of action, political action, um, but, I, but the, kind of building the awareness is super important to understand that, you know, the air quality is not great and there we need to, this is a top priority and we need to think about, you know, how do we plan our city so that uh, we get more trees and we don't allow permitting for facilities um, that are putting more noxious uses in our, neighborhoods um, and thinking more strategically about that. Um, Philadelphia, there's a, a website that it is a you know, public website. You can go on this yourself. It's called ejscreen.gov, um, ejscreen.epa.gov. You can go on Philly and you can um, play around with the data. This is kind of fun for, um, you know, if you, if you kind of want to put in your zip code in your house, you can put in, you can kind of see what's around you. I, I recommend doing it. It's um, it's a sort of eye opening, but you can also choose, you know, how much ozone, how close are you to traffic, lead, uh, lead paint, um, super fun proximity. And, and then you can also look at the socioeconomic indicators. Um, so, here, this map is showing you really the tra traffic proximity and the PM 2.5, which is, and, and PM 10, right, coming from, um, coming from uh, the, the transportation networks, right? And then um, the PM 2.5 is actually, this purple air monitor is, is catching it by sending down like a laser beam that's kind of calculating how, how many particulates it's seeing in the field of the laser. And uh, Russ can explain that better than me. I'm sure there's uh, people on this call who can explain that more, but, um, but I really just, I'm kind of want to highlight that, you know, the, the interesting thing about PM 2.5 is being able um, to, you know, to, to kind of recognize that, um, that like these very, very small particulates are getting deep into people's lungs. And so being able to kind of see it, um, make it visible, I think is something that's very important. Um, uh, let's, and so, you know, this is just a slide showing you, I mean, I think most people know this, but air pollution impacts our lives in many ways uh, from COPD to um, stroke, heart disease, heart attack, lung cancer, problems during, um, uh, during pregnancy, you know, asthma, uh, bronchitis. So, you know, having poor lung health impacts your health and your life expectancy. And we can see some of the data that um, where, you know, we, we can see in Philly that, um, you know, we also have these, the urban heat island neighborhoods are the places that, um, we are that that the that asthma 
kind of is also highest in these same neighborhoods. So we're starting, so, I mean, that's the other issue that we wanna really highlight is that um, asthma, racism, redlining, heat, urban heat islands, environmental justice concerns, they all are overlapping. Um, the other nice thing about these purple air monitors, they also can calculate um, heat. So there's also a possibility of doing more research around that. Um, so there's this uh, public health concerns that are associated with better understanding what's happening at the local level um, and then kind of trying to figure out what to do about it. Um, so, I mean, the good news right now is that the city um, is doing some of this work. They've done this, um, urban, they've done a heat vulnerability study, um, you know, and, and one of the things that we're also advocating and, and is like, you know, there's so much data out there. So you can also add, you can make this data finer and you can also get the real time air pollution data. So, you know, these, a lot of these, the, this is like the heat vulnerability index for the city of Philadelphia. This is really a kind of a large scale planning tool, but there are ways to use some of these kind of accessible community technologies to do much more real time data layers um, that are able to kind of talk to people about heat emergencies. And, you know, if you had a more expensive monitor, you could look at ozone, you know, and there's some ways to, um, that we can kind of think more strategically about um, deploying, you know, the, our, the city has a lot of university researchers, a ton of hospitals, and thinking about how to, you know, make sure that we're supporting some of the public health work and planning work the city is doing. Um, you know, a lot of people, when you talk to them about um, air pollution, don't necessarily think it's top priority. The city is also having a lot of other challenges uh, right now, particularly around gun violence. And I think one of the things that I also want to emphasize is that um, air pollution, urban heat islands, environmental justice, um, redlining, racism, uh, these are all these are all problems that uh, need to be thought about in conjunction intersectionally and um, so, so I'll get later to how, how we're kind of seeing these purple air monitors fit into that larger conversation, but I just want to put that out there because like a lot, some people will say, you know, the air pollution, great, but I don't have time to worry about air pollution. My, I'm, I'm much more worried about my safety. Um, and so, you know, thinking systematically about, you know, if you had good air quality, well, how would that change? Um, public safety and and gun violence and you know are there you know so can we also like expand um, our thinking about environmental problems to kind of include other people in the conversation so it's larger um, so um, when you're talking about air pollution asthma is also uh, something that um, many of us have, and in Philadelphia, you know, this is a map showing you of uh, showing you asthma rates is from EJ screen, and unfortunately, that the city has um, twenty one percent of the children have asthma. Um, you know, this can lead to like missing school and uh, poor health um, outcomes, and you know, so that the kind of thinking about the social determinants of health and how they, they work together. Um, the other thing about the air monitors is you can also get an indoor air monitor. And so a lot of um, air pollution exposure is also from the home. And that's also really important when we're thinking about like climate adaptation, because we're gonna be needing to do a lot of um, kind of uh, home repairs, weatherization, you know, fixing roof leaks. Um, these things don't necessarily sound like climate, policies, but, you know, all, if you, we want to address uh, environmental justice, air pollution, the social determinants of health and climate, we're going to have to figure out how to com have conversations that include, you know, how do I get my roof fixed? You know, yes, you want a solar panel on my roof, but I care about um, making sure that it, there's no mold in my house and I, I have dealt, dealt with the, you know, a bug problem. So, um, you know, all of this also leads to lower life expectancy. Um, it depends on what neighborhood you're in and it's very localized. And that's actually why 
kind of one of the main arguments for using these purple air monitors, like let's get the data to the local level so that, and like, let's get some real time, real data and get people excited about it. Um, so these are the purple air monitors. And the one that we use is this uh, 279 and, and we use it because it connects to Wi-Fi. I found actually that it is amazingly complicated to, um, even though it's really a simple thing, you plug it in and there's this code and, uh, and but, you know, getting a temple to put one on took me a lot of administrative um, challenges. We just, the Academy of Natural Sciences is going to put one on. That also took um, some challenges, you know, like getting people to be able to kind of figure out how to get something like this to live on their Wi-Fi um, at an institutional scale is sometimes complicated. Actually, it's as is, I have one in my back, this is the one for my backyard, but it's much easier for me to do it as an individual, actually, than to kind of get Temple to do it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is just build this awareness that like, hey, you can do this. It's not that hard. It's not that expensive. And trying to also build a pot of money that we can help work with um, people around the city to install them. So I think universities are kind of the obvious target, um, thinking about libraries, thinking about partnering with public schools and, th and all the sort of educational um, kind of synergies that can come out from having the purple air monitors. And, and so these are also some of the other monitors. This is like an indoor monitor. There are other companies as well that have um, purple air, that have sensors. And I in no way, I, I'm not making any money off this purple air program, you know. So the reason that we kind of like the purple air monitors and that Russ uses them is they're really a plug and play um, and they're live. So um, I don't, are you guys seeing this map? Uh, Susan, are you, yeah. So you know, you can see they're they're um, they're they're live. Today is like a great air day, so go out and walk around. Um, actually, this map. So my house is this gray one where I've just disconnected it, so it's not working. And actually, you can also see. You know, this is a problem with the civic science. Like the one at Temple is down, and the other one we just installed are down. Um, so, you know, there is some troubleshooting that needs to happen, but over here in Camden, um, Jonathan Lackow, who is at Temple as well, he's been working with a lot, a lot of environmental justice groups over there to try to make sure that these, um, that, that there's like more monitoring of some of the environmental justice problems happening in Camden, and they've been partnering also with the uh, New Jersey DEP to kind of use some of that data. So the more that we can get purple air monitors around in different places, kind of the better data we'll have. And then kind of creating also, uh, uh, you know, a community of people who are kind of watching this stuff. And then that's one of the things Russ and I've talked about. It's, it's not just you stick a purple air monitor up there. It's like you actually need somebody to kind of always be checking it. And um, up here at number 14, that's actually one of my graduate students. So she and I are always calling each other, texting each other like, hey, your house is much worse than mine. Um, and you know, her house actually is often worse than mine because her tree canopy, um, you know, she is is she doesn't have as good tree canopy as I have in West Philly, and she also is across the street from some environmental justice sites. So um, the more that we can kind of strategically locate these around the city, I think that's really where we need to go. Um, are you back? You, are you back in my presentation here? Okay. So this is the article I wrote in November when the wildfire um, was. Uh, the, sorry, not wildfire. This is a tire fire. This is like always seems crazy to me that I even have to say that sentence, but Philadelphia is a little bit of the wild west of environmental justice. Um, so Charles Ellison from Word Radio and I wrote this article, um, you know, he's, he and I have been working a lot on environmental justice issues and I really just, I, I, I'm usually not, um, uh, not such a kind of angry person, but I um, was absolutely outraged that my purple air monitor was off the charts um, crazy at, at 445 um, parts per million. Um, and it was, uh, you know, in the zone that 
you really don't know what you're breathing, right? And I, I at my house, um, it smelled like there were tires in my house burning in the basement. Um, I was texting Russ, Russ at the middle of the night saying, you know, are these numbers, what is happening with these numbers? Um, this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, we know that the city has a lot of these um, kind of industrial sites, and we, we're starting to see that there's some real risk to having them around. So if you look at the map on the right, you can see um, you can see the kind of clusters of these are these are actually permitted junkyards um, and active auto wrecking um, sites. Um, but then if you look on the left, this is the city's monitors. So when you wonder why my monitor in West Philly is getting the crazy reading, well, I would argue that it has a lot to do with the fact that I have a monitor over there and the city doesn't. Um, so I've actually been in conversations with um, public health and you know I think they're, they have some concerns about the purple air monitors. They don't, um, they don't think they get to the kind of fine, perfect data that they need to meet EPA requirements. Um, my argument back to them is that, and, and with Russ is that, um, you know, that they show you trends. So if you are a community and you kind of see something happening again and again, your neighborhood is, is showing up at much higher, like much worse numbers on the purple air, then there needs to be really a trigger that allows public health to come in with the fancy monitors. You know, they have some mobile fancier monitors. So building this awareness with residents that, you know, yeah, it's not okay to have poor air quality and it's not okay to have much worse air quality than everyone else in Philly. And then if you start to see that you have all these trends, like I, I, again and again, these things are happening, you know, who do we call? What's the network? What so raising awareness, creating a group of people who are kind of educated about air quality, who to call, who to make the complaints. One of the reasons that Russ is really fantastic is um, you know, if you have a complaint, you can email Russ and he will do the 311 complaint um, for you. And he also will work with air management services to kind of make sure somebody sees it. And that's also the argument that I would say about my own experience of with the tire fire is without that data, I have no proof of anything. You know, they can just say, oh, you're just paranoid or anything, but I actually have some screenshots and some data to say, you know, I don't know how bad it was, but it was bad. <laughs> and I need you to have, I need to understand as a as a resident that you know you guys are prepared for this emergency to really um you know keep keep me and my family my neighbors safe and and i think what you see here on the left is you know the city's kind of very old school traditional view of monitoring which doesn't kind of it doesn't um speak to the cumulative impacts of environmental justice. So it's really not there yet. I think there is some exciting work that's being done in Philly about, and this is um, something I'd love to talk with you guys about, is um, that you know several uh, city councilors are pushing for cumul cumulative health uh, impact legislation, which would allow for a more um, localized, understanding of environmental justice. So the environmental justice um, factors might not just be the federal factors, there could also be another layer thinking about, well, you know, this neighborhood has, you know, not this one per not one noxious use, but it has 10 noxious uses. And, you know, because of that, we're not going to allow 11th, right? So that, I think if that legislation gets through, then we're also going to have the need for much more um, kind of fine scale data and also much more citizen engagement in um, or civic engagement in these conversations. Um, so, so I think there are a lot of opportunities for this using accessible community technology. Um, 
you know, it's, it's $300, which is not, which is honestly not accessible. You know, I'm not going to spend $300. Most people are not going to um, do that, but institutions can, and we can fund this. I've talked to some church leaders about ways that, you know, we could use churches and, um, you know, across the city, we could, um, we could kind of mobilize, you know, enough of these monitors to kind of get, um, to get kind of economies of scale going. So I think the ability to see these variations in air quality is really important. And that helps us get down to the kind of cause of the air pollution, right? So that's back, get, brings me back to the beginning. So, you know, is the air good in Philly? It kind of depends where you live and what's happening around your neighborhood. And, um, you know, do you, is there a junkyard across the street or is somebody burning something? Is there a new construction where there's construction dust all over the place? You live in a gentrifying neighborhood. Um, I think for me, this bullet point of can, they can be strategically installed in these neighborhoods with environmental justice concerns. So, you know, we are um, the, the monitors from the city are not they're not targeted to look for problems. Right. They're not they're not, they don't scan the city and say, you know what? this neighborhood really, really needs a monitor, but we could do that with these lower cost monitors. Um, and we could also figure out a way to connect these and support the city's air management system and to build much more trust between city and residents. Um, I feel like we're making some good progress having these conversations with um, the uh, air management system, public health. Um, I think there's a lot more room for that. And if the policy framework of the new legislation comes through, there's going to be a lot of interest in environmental justice. How do we know it? How do we measure it? What do we do about it? Um, I also think this concept of kind of how does this all connect to these larger challenges that I was trying to outline of health, climate change, gun violence, greening, transportation, and, you know, and then finally the role of universities, you know, how does universities, how are we contributing to um, air pollution? You know, we have all these students and faculty and staff driving their cars in, you know, we are essentially large, uh, or kind of medium sized cities within Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, kind of showing the responsibility for air quality is really important. And then leveraging some of these institutions so that they can be actors in making environmental improvement. Um, so schools, libraries, religious facilities, universities, medical centers. I mean, we all have an interest in breathing better, cleaner air. So the first thing is always like admitting you have a problem. I'm arguing that you can kind of see you have a problem. You can, right now you can't see it. Um, nobody knows how to read the data, and but if there's a dashboard that gets us all involved, we're checking it all the time, we kind of understand, you know, today's a bad, it's a bad ozone day, it's an urban heat island, and it's like these neighborhoods need, they need cooling centers, they need, you know, so who did somebody send out the did somebody send out the uh, note to them to tell them, you know, today's not a good day to go for a run, you know, or it's a, it's a, you gotta stay inside, you gotta, you know, and where do people go? Um, I think as we kind of have those conversations, we're much better able to address the kind of intersectional challenges of pollution, health, climate, and racial and social justice. Um, there's also just so many partners, and this is actually what I love about Philadelphia, the just, you know, since um, like I wrote that one article and, uh, you know, then I wrote another Inquirer article, I've written some citizens art articles. Um, you know, we have the Clean Air Council uh, with Russ Erbo and others. We, you know, we've gotten some money from uh, the National Science Foundation to do a different project that, but it's related to this project. Um, the Center for Sustainable Communities at Temple, the Duckworth Scholar Studio at Temple has helped me. Um, the Library at Temple's put this on. We got the Office of Sustainability, Academy of Natural Sciences. There's Philadelphia Higher Education Network. Um, Philly Wireless is also installed one of these recently. Village of Arts and Humanities, ASE. There's also, you know, the City Council. And then I also forgot to mention this Environmental Justice Advisory Commission, the Office of Sustainability, uh, public health commissioner, you know, hunting park. And so there's so many people who are like really excited and interested in, in environmental justice in the city of Philadelphia. And I think, um, you know, what one thing that I've learned from 
kind of doing research about institutions is sometimes you have to go small to go big. You know, these are small. This is a $300 investment. You just, you, you can buy it, you can email me, you can get involved, you know, but, but once we kind of build that, we can build other things together. So, you know, I don't think we're gonna solve the world with the $300 things. I think it's just the beginning, um, at, but I really kind of wanna hear, you know, your thoughts. I think this work connects to kind of where the city's going, um, the Environmental Justice Commission for the city, you know, the Community Health Act, which is about cumulative health impact, the public health commissioners, all these community university partnerships, um, you know, all my students who are worried that, you know, the world is ending, but how can they do anything, you know? So, I mean, how do we give, you know, so we've been doing some stuff at Temple about like getting students SEPTA passes. Um, so being able to kind of connect small things to big things and educate people and build networks is, is really where I think we are right now. Um, and I would love to hear your uh, comments and uh, kind of how do we scale up? Um, I am going to leave you with, I have, this is, I'll uh, leave you with my, um, uh, this is my contact information. If you um, wanna reach out to me and, you know, it's like, if you wanna get a purple air monitor, it's, it's not, you know, you, I don't own purple air. I have no stock in them. Uh, you just order one and you'll be part of the system. And then you can work with us on like, you know, what's next. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a somewhat scrappy project, but I, I see a lot of potential in um, kind of just, you know, the getting going and kind of having these conversations. So I really appreciate you guys giving me the chance and you guys coming out um, at, from six to seven to talk with me. So thanks a lot. And, oh, someone asked me about the, the numbers and colors on the map. So if it's green, it means they try to kind of make it easy for you. So green is good air. <laughs> and then it kind of goes up to, you know, green, yellow, orange, kind of a darker orange, then like a red, and then the sort of, you know, there's a tire fire kind of crazy color. Um, yeah, and, and it's, if you go on purpleair.com, you can, I, I sometimes kind of have fun just exploring it and you can kind of go around the world and see who has these networks um, and, you know, and what they're seeing in their communities. A lot of people in California have, become particularly interested in um, in using in using these particularly because of the wildfires. Um, let's see. Uh, the dots on the map are the actual purple air monitors. So these these purple air monitors are all the time sending up data to uh, to the cloud and it is showing up on that map real time. So I think that's the other question. Um, the cost of the monitors is 200, about $280. Um, can an industry host them? Anyone can host one. A uh, citizen can get one. You know, you can get one in your house. You can get, so it, it's, it's, a, it's very, it's a very open. And, you know, I've, I've had some conversations with other people who are sort of trying to um, kind of build networks that are, you know, thinking about monetizing community data, you know, th this data is open, you can download it, it's there. So it's not about um, trying to kind of sell you back your data. Uh, so, so that's an advantage of it. Now, I mean, I, I do think, um, you know, there's also a question like longer term, we, if, you know, I'm not sure you have to use a purple air monitor, maybe that's one of the projects we have is, you know, could we be building a lot of this technology is not that complicated. So universities could be building lower cost monitors to actually make it more accessible. Um, so I guess what I would love to hear is, uh, you know, maybe you guys can just put it in the chat, like, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, and kind of what you heard, you think it's, uh, you, you want a purple air monitor, you uh, are afraid to have one on your, you know, I, I don't know, just any thoughts or are you worried about air quality? 
So I'll just give you a second to kind of throw it in the chat or ask me questions or give me your feedback. Give me, yeah, I'll take, I'll take a, a facial question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, thanks so much for your talk. It was interesting. Um, I actually work at the Science History Institute in Old City. It's a museum focused on history of science, ways science is practiced differently in different places and times. So environmental justice is like something that we have a recurring interest in, um, what sort of research gets priority and what impact that has on the world. Um, but I was curious, you mentioned redlining a few times. Um, and I was thinking of there was like a New York Times article published maybe a couple of months ago about links between uh, redlining and air pollution. I think there had just been like a nationwide study linking geographically, like neighborhood specific differences in air quality. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering about what the situation is in Philadelphia, if that's something you're looking into, if that's something we do have the fine grain level of detail about, or if that's where we're headed. Just yeah, I mean, the data, the maps like that you see from the New York Times, I mean, they hold true also for Philly. So I mean, the problem with the red with red line neighborhoods, these are neighborhoods that were disinvested. So they also don't have the same level of tree canopy, the same level of parks, you know, so the very, the same communities that are, um, they're really like missing the protective things we, so, you know, I think of environmental issues as like, there's the negative stuff that, and then there's the protective stuff. So if you live in Philly, depending on your neighborhood, you know, yes, you know, the whole city has air quality, but some of us live in neighborhoods that have you know, tree canopy, so it's going to be cooler, or we can walk to a park so we can, you know, and exercise, or, you know, we like, you know, our housing has not been degrading for, you know, you know, 60 years with no maintenance, you know, because we haven't been able to access capital to improve our houses, right? Or we're not, you know, people aren't housing insecure and they have money to do home repairs and um, home equity loans and, you know, they can do efficiency energy. So, so it's like the, it's really the compounding redlining is like when you kind of pull the rug out from a neighborhood and you prevent it from being, being able to adapt because it's becoming more and more clear that all the things that, you know, we need to be able to adapt are like trees and parks and, you know, uh, home repairs and energy improve efficiency and electrification and, um, you know, better transportation networks and all these things are things that we've historically um, excluded, uh, you know, in the red line communities and, you know, black and brown communities. And so that's, you know, this is really the kind of what the, the kind of outcome of structural racism. So uh, does that answer some of your question? I think so. I guess I was um, just clarifying also the level of data that we have for like a neighborhood to neighborhood difference in Philadelphia. So there's like, a is lot that something you're able to see in your data that like neighborhoods that were historically redlined we have yes i don't have that data but we have the city has we have that we have we we could see that data we need more um we we do need more local um kind of heat data because it can be you know it i mean that heat can vary so much depending on like so many factors that like there's actually I think that the heat research is like moving fast so that we're adding all these other variables into it. Um, we, part of the, the other project that I did not get to show you is like trying to figure out how to add like all the different types of data, including air pollution and including red line, including everything into one, mm. one doc, one map that we could show you all these things. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, there's the data is there, but you got, I mean, we need better data. Like if somebody wants to fund better data, yeah, we could, I'm sure we could use better data, but, but we know enough to know that what you're seeing in the New York Times holds true in Philly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's enough. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
I'm seeing, oh, is it better installed ground level or say a rooftop? Um, so Carolyn, I think it, uh, um, it's better to, uh, yeah, to, I mean, you can install it higher, but they're kind of designed for lower. Um, so that, you know, I had one in my backyard, it's probably like 10 feet up. So, but the, and the nice thing about that is you're also getting like lower, lower level, like what people actually breathe. Um, so if that is helpful, um, Dan, you said, is there a plan how to use the data in a systematic way once it's gathered or as it's gathered? Um, we need that. Um, and I think that that is, uh, you know, uh, there is no plan right now. I think we need, I, I think what I want to do right now is get um, get people interested in it. And Russ is also doing this at the Clean Air Council, but um, kind of, and, you know, once we get, if that map, the purple air map that I showed you that doesn't have that much on it, if it had it all over the place, then we actually have data we can talk about that might be interesting. Right now, there's not enough of these to be interesting. Um, so it's really a, a factor of kind of scale, you know? So I, I mean, that, well, I have, I, you know, I, when I look around Philly, I think, okay, Penn gets one, you know, Temple gets one, Drexel gets one, you know, community college gets one, then all the high school, or, you know, you get them across high schools, you get them at libraries, you know, all these public institutions get them. And then we kind of figure out churches have them. Then we figure out how to wait a way to like make a group of people who, you know, they don't have to pay to get them, but they have to, you know, we subsidize them to make it more accessible. And then, you know, then we suddenly have data. But right now we don't have data. <laughs> so if that's the answer. Uh sure. Somebody who said, great project. Curious, what is the concern with installing the monitors at universities slash institutions? Is it cybersecurity, having a record of hyperlocal AQ or other? Um, they also want to know, are the monitors recording just instantaneously, 10-minute average intervals, or also 24-hour and annual averages? I guess yeah. that's the cycle of monitoring. Right. Um, some of this I might need Russ to answer for me. So the, 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 the question I have is, it's a great question of why it's so hard, at, but universities, but it's in part because a lot of universities need a password to get on the Wi-Fi that you have to go through a two-step authentication. And that's why it's much easier to put it on in your house. So like you have to figure out how to get, you, you know, if, if I just bring this thing over to Temple, I can't figure out, I gotta go find the tech guy, the what, you know, and then the other thing there is like a temple, um, you know, I got the, the, I had to go to the Dean of the library and he really likes this project. So I, he helped me get one of these on, but without the Dean, I can't get it on. So it's much more of a, and, and that is also true. Like the Academy of Natural Sciences, we had a bunch of meetings with all the tech people. Um, I think there could be concerns about like, uh, that, you know, it could be or that cybersecurity, maybe, you know, maybe some universities are concerned that you might be able to hack into the network through one of these things. Um, so that, that, yeah, there, I mean, I think that that's, we're, we're finding that it's kind of more annoying than you think it is, because yeah, you know, I, I ordered a bunch for people and I was like, here, here's a purple air monitor. And you know, I'm still waiting for a few people to put them up um, because there's so many hoops to, you know, just getting things on the internet. Um, and in terms of the, the instantaneous, um, you, I think the data, I mean, the data is around um, and downloading. I, I'm, I haven't done any research with it about like 10 minute, you know, the annual averages, but you can, um, you know, if you, if you look on the website, you could play around with what, what data is available. And I can also connect you with Russ Erbo, who's um, like, is, you know, focused more on that work, if that's helpful. Someone else asked, which states have the most frequent monitoring? Uh, they heard New Jersey has the most polluted air, but some say that's because the state monitors more frequently. So, yeah, no, that's a great question because that's I, that's actually one of the challenges I think 
<laughs> that, you know, the best way to have good air is not to monitor it, right? So I think that's, you know, that's um, a really great question. I One thing I have, I, I don't, um, you know, I think the, the federal government sets guidelines that like, you know, Philadelphia is in compliance with its monitoring, right? So like that, um, and all these states are kind of hitting the federal guideline. Um, some states may do more. Um, and that is, is uh, you know, certainly a conversation that needs to happen. I also think the um, making sure it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not just these like super expensive 10 sites and nothing else. Um, you know, so, so I think there's going to be, have to be a push in the future, you know, and, and, and with the Biden administration, I think there is some interest in this is like getting, getting new monitoring approaches that are kind of leveraging our, the new technology, but also our, are kind of more local understanding of environmental justice. Um, and some states like New Jersey are actually kind of ahead of the game in that case. And I don't know if that is uh, kind of it, why you're seeing the numbers about air quality or if they also, I mean, New Jersey also does have a lot of pollution. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's like, a, it is, it does raise the kind of question of, you know, like there might be some people who don't want to see all this monitoring because once you monitor it and you kind of get people involved, then people might want to do um, something, you know, people, people might want you to like actually take action. Um, there is no fee to keep it online. So uh, this is the question from Kathy. Um, you, you just buy it in Purple Air puts it up there. Their goal is to like build a network of um, kind of civic science around around the world. So, you know, I think they're they're not uh, charging you a fee to to get online, you know, which 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 is really good because you know, I think some of the people are trying to do that, you know, so that you, we really also have to kind of make sure um, you know, we're choosing partners who are kind of, you know, have like an open data focus. I, I'm this, you know, I'd be more than happy for this to just the city to make these or, you know, have universities, high school kids make these, you know, we could figure out something, make our own platform for it. Um, but we're just using this right now because it works and you plug it in and, and it goes up there and we don't have the technical, you know, money to build something, you know, so it's already built and it's part of this global network. So kind of just getting it in there, you know, do I think it should be a, a nonprofit? Yeah. Sounds good. But uh, yeah, so, but there's no fee. I don't see any right now. Anybody else have questions? And Christina, maybe you can put your slide back up that has the your um, information. Oh, my info. Sure. Let's see. Well, so people can follow up. And I will also say that um, we have a goal, the Wagner, to have Christina present here in person sometime next year. So um, we're hoping to um, do a program, a little, a longer program focused on this work. And the other thing, Susan, I would, I just wanted to let people know is I didn't talk about it today, but, um, you know, we are doing this much larger project about environmental justice and kind of monitoring, and, you know, how to kind of get this more localized approach. So if anyone's like interested, we're doing a series of workshops in the next few months and you know we're looking for community participants so if that's something that's interesting to you you know please send me an email and I will fill you in and and we'd love to be a site for a monitor too so just putting a plug in <laughs> okay great yeah no I think at this point the, the challenge is kind of fundraising you know I think some of it is like you know, some of these institutions have $300, so I'm not worried about them. Some don't. Um, and, you know, so how do we kind of, you don't need a ton of money to get this network going big enough that we could start, you know, really building real education around it. So, I, you know, that's kind of the next thing is like, how do we 
kind of sell this somewhat scrappy project into something that, you know, is, has enough legs that, you know, when you look at the map, you say, oh yeah, that, those, those numbers are terrible all the time. And what's happening in that neighborhood? Oh, let's bring in the, and so, you know, kind of building that trust of different institutions and getting partners. And, um, and so like right now I'm just in the sort of awareness raising. So it's really great to be invited to like, you know, have the talk about it and, you know, love to uh, partner with anyone who's interested. So thanks a lot. Well, I think that we're about out of time. Um, Christina, can you share the last slide? Just the last, um, the final. Oh, yeah, one. this one. Science on tap. Yep. Yep. Again, a reminder, the Wagner is going to have an in-person talk on June 1st, and we hope you'll come see us. The museum's also open, so we hope to see you here. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you, Joanna. And thanks for joining us and have a great day, everyone, or rest of your night. Thank you. Good night.